I often encounter people who believe that plans for flights to the moon, Mars and other planets, as well as efforts to explore more and more distant space, are just a waste of money. They argue that all these endeavors are merely aimed at padding budgets, while the same money could be used with much greater benefit on Earth. I strongly disagree with this opinion. Yes, space programs are by no means cheap, but the efforts made in this direction 20, 30, and 50 years ago have already significantly changed our lives for the better today. Satellite technologies have provided us with satellite navigation, global communication, the internet, more accurate weather prediction, and much more. Furthermore, we rarely consider how many clever inventions developed for space are now being used in our everyday lives. For instance, Teflon, discovered back in 1938, was known only to a small number of chemists for a long time. It wasn't until it was used for insulating spacecraft that the idea of using it to coat pans emerged. Similarly, Velcro, invented by Swiss engineer George de Mestral in 1941, remained unutilized for a long time until it was tried in astronaut suits. The idea turned out to be so successful that it was exported to Earth. Even the famous lubricant WD-40 was invented in 1953 for the Rocket Chemical Company and was intended for use as a water displacement agent in the Atlas rockets. The history of space inventions finding a second life on Earth is an interesting topic itself. If you'd like us to delve into this in one of our next videos, be sure to write about it in the comments. In general, it turns out that scientific and technical thinking requires some source of inspiration and space exploration has proven to be one of the best driving forces for engineering and technical minds. The only contender that could compete with space as the best catalyst for scientific and technical progress might be the arms race. So, in my opinion, space exploration is the better choice. However, speaking specifically about the moon, there are entirely practical considerations for its exploration, and that's what we'll discuss today. Occasionally, in science fiction works, there's mention of future helium-3 mining on the moon, a light isotope of ordinary helium-4, which, unlike its heavier counterpart, contains not two but just one neutron. Here's the deal. Helium-3 is indeed nearly the perfect fuel for fusion reactors. All modern fusion reactors use a fuel mix of deuterium, consisting of one proton and one neutron, and tritium, containing one proton and two neutrons. When these substances' atoms combine, they form helium-4, specifically with two protons and two neutrons, and the extra neutron flies away. And this neutron poses a significant problem. Firstly, around 80% of the energy produced in nuclear fusion is converted into the kinetic energy of neutrons. As neutrons are uncharged particles, it's very difficult to harness this energy, leading to a significant decrease in the reactor's efficiency. Moreover, the neutron flux represents one of the most dangerous forms of radiation, requiring additional measures to protect station personnel. Equally concerning is that many materials degrade in powerful neutron fluxes, deteriorating their physical properties. Additionally, tritium required for such reactions is very expensive. One kilogram costs around $30 million, making the energy produced in tritium-based reactors quite costly. However, replacing tritium with helium-3 would significantly change the situation for the better. Firstly, as a result of such a reaction, helium-4 is produced, but this time, the extra particle is not a neutron but a proton, which is charged and easier to extract and harness its energy. Secondly, the flow of protons is easier to contain within the reactor. Thirdly, helium-3 is much cheaper than tritium. One kilogram costs approximately $80,000, However, helium-3 reserves on Earth are severely limited, estimated to be around 37,000 tons. But on the Moon, helium-3 is present in significant amounts. Based on the isotope content in studied lunar soil samples, it's estimated that the Moon holds about 2.5 million tons of helium-3, which in terms of energy is roughly equivalent to around 40 trillion tons of oil. This amount is approximately 170 times more than all the known oil reserves on Earth. Certainly, for now, we don't know how to initiate a fusion nuclear reaction using a mixture of helium-3 with deuterium. We're also not particularly good at it with deuterium-tritium mixtures. 
However, if we do manage to achieve this, Helium-3 will instantly become a resource of strategic importance, akin to how oil or uranium are today. And of course, it would be very beneficial if by that time we already possessed the technology to mine it on the moon and transport it back to Earth. By the way, the extraction process will be a bit more complex than depicted in science fiction movies. In 100,000 tons of lunar soil, there's an average of about one gram of helium-3. Even though transporting cargo from the moon to Earth might be easier than from Earth to the moon, hauling millions of tons of regolith through space is unlikely to be commercially justified. It would be more practical to establish ore processing plants directly on the moon, signifying its full-scale utilization and colonization. However, it's possible that there are areas on the moon richer in this valuable element, but determining this requires detailed geological exploration of the moon. In short, no matter what, in order to extract helium-3 in the near or distant future, we must start flying to the moon today. Moreover, a more in-depth study of our satellite's geology during its colonization process might yield unexpected results. For instance, we can discover deposits of other minerals that might be worth mining even on the moon. Since we know very little about our satellite, we might not even comprehend the wealth it holds. However, the moon could become a valuable energy source for humanity, even before earthly scientists and engineers unlock the secrets of nuclear fusion. For instance, a massive solar power station could be placed on the lunar surface, essentially occupying a significant portion of our satellite. One of the more detailed projects of this kind, the so-called Lunar Ring, was presented in 2011 by the Japanese company Shimizu. The Japanese proposed covering the moon's equator with a continuous ring of solar panels, measuring 11,000 kilometers in length and 500 kilometers in width. This solar panel ring, according to their calculations, could produce around 13 petawatts, or 13 times 10 to the power of 15 watts of electrical energy. To put it simply, the lunar ring could fully meet humanity's energy needs, meaning all Earth's power stations could simply be shut down, removing the harm they caused to the Earth's ecology. The generated electric power could be transmitted from moon to Earth via microwave electromagnetic radiation or using laser emitters, However, this construction is quite a task. Just transporting such a quantity of solar panels to the moon will be quite costly and problematic. Yet, a more clever approach could involve manufacturing solar panels directly on the moon. Everything needed for this, like silicon, aluminum, iron, etc. is present in the lunar soil, and any missing materials might be found through geological surveys of our satellite or, in the worst-case scenario, could be transported from Earth. But before even considering something like this, we must first learn to confidently fly to the moon and back, as well as develop technologies for constructing buildings and structures on the moon. In short, to embark on anything similar, we need to do a significant amount of groundwork first. For instance, several unconventional approaches to transporting cargo from Earth to the moon and back are currently under development. In August 2023, a group of scientists from the UK and the U.S. published mathematical calculations for a highly interesting project. The essence of this project is to launch not a spacecraft but something resembling a continuously operating space station that orbits the Earth in a very wide orbit, so that at one point, the station approaches the Earth, and at another, the Moon. The calculations consider the gravity of the Moon, Earth, and the Sun, and the authors claim that such an orbit would be optimal when the station approaches the Earth, it could be loaded with cargo intended for delivery to the Moon, and when it approaches the Moon, unloading could take place. The project would only be profitable with significant cargo turnover between Earth and the Moon, which means it will only be viable if the colonization of the Moon becomes truly extensive. By the way, it's quite probable that the first, or even the primary, and maybe even the only colonists of the moon won't be humans but rather robots or other automatic and remotely controlled devices. Regardless, the moon isn't the most appealing place for prolonged human habitation due to its extremely low gravity, radiation 200 times higher, and similar conditions. Russia and China, for instance, focus on robots in their moon colonization projects, considering sending living colonists to the moon as an optional endeavor. Lastly, 
but not less significant, the moon could serve as an advanced base for further exploration of the solar system. Thanks to the moon's extremely low gravity and lack of atmosphere, maneuvering a spacecraft into a lunar orbit will require roughly 50 times less fuel than the same operation on Earth. Furthermore, the moon contains sufficient reserves of water and carbon dioxide, making it possible to construct rocket fuel production facilities, for example, methane, using local resources. In simpler terms, the moon could serve as a refueling station for distant space expeditions to Mars, Venus, Jupiter, and beyond, or even to the asteroid belt, which holds considerable treasures. Meteorites falling to Earth contain high concentrations of valuable metals such as platinum, palladium, osmium, rhenium, rhodium, ruthenium, germanium, gold, and more. For example, the platinum content in meteorites can reach 30 grams per ton. A deposit on Earth with an 8-gram concentration per ton of ore is considered rich. On average, a kilometer-sized asteroid may contain up to 7.5 tons of platinum alone, valued at several hundred billion dollars. Processing asteroids in the future could become a very lucrative business, providing Earth access to rare metals. For instance, platinum is widely used in electronics, optical instruments, medicine, chemistry as a catalyst, and many more. The moon might serve as a transit base for space miners, potentially a place for processing and enriching the resources they've mined. But to achieve this, the moon needs to be colonized. In summary, flying to the moon is a necessity. Even if the initial expeditions prove to be quite expensive, in the long run, we can significantly benefit from the resources invested. Besides, it's simply cool and fascinating.